Hello there, everybody, it's Subbutter Night 2 AK Nightmare, and I've got good news and bad news. Good news, we're starting on the fourth chapter of Higarashi, Himatsubushi, I believe that's how you pronounce the name. Bad news, um, okay, first off, thank you guys for, very much for sending me that link to, uh, I believe it was called GitHub, um, there were two people that sent that, so both of you, thank you guys very much, you know, you guys know who you are, I mean, hell, you could even, you guys could even check the comments, you'll know who sent me those links, but, um, for some odd reason, okay, I've spent maybe a day and a half trying to figure this out. Help me. I even signed up for GitHub because I thought that might fix the problem. But, there were like, th two things. There was one called the patch where I, I was able to download that successfully. And, the voices and I think graphics, it would not let me download for the life of me. It kept on encountering two things. First, it was a network error, which I thought, okay, that's probably my internet. So I went ahead and just made all, that, made all that work again. Thought it would help. Get downloaded. Get about halfway downloaded. All of a sudden, it would immediately say forbidden. And it just would not let me download the voice or anything like that at all. It just would not, for the life of me, let me download it whatsoever. So... I haven't opened this up since I installed the uh, first patch file that it had. So, I don't know what that patch did. I followed the steps to install it, but for some reason, the other two files, it would not let me download at all, whatsoever. So, unfortunately, this first episode and possibly the rest of this Higurashi may end up not having any voices whatsoever, so in which case I'll probably have to do my pitiful attempt at trying to do a female voice whatsoever. But, um, unfortunately, that's the situation. So, I mean, like I said, I even tried getting an account on GitHub, and that didn't change the issue whatsoever. I tried, like, three, four different times. The files would get, like, a third of the way downloaded, and then it would say forbidden. Or even sometimes it would just say forbidden right out. So, unfortunately, that's the situation. But, that wasn't going to stop me from trying to at least get one episode of this recorded, because I've been dying to, you know, finish off the questions arc of Higurashi, and I can't wait to get started on the answers arc. Also, tomorrow, and probably tomorrow, I'm pretty sure tomorrow, there will be an episode of Fate Stay Night, so look forward to that! Anyway, let's finally get started on this nightmare of a series. Okay, let's see what we got here. Himatsubushi, for you, the final mystery. I now entrust you with all the mysteries hidden within Higarashi when they cry. However comical it may be, if you have reached any conjecture, then you have passed. This final novel is a meager reward for you. Conjecture is impossible. You have the right to reject this story. Okay, so pretty much it's going to be impossible to make anything. Any theories whatsoever. Good, I'm up for the challenge. Let's start. <laughs> I will never get used to that. Who is the criminal, you ask? Don't we search for them in this story. Who is the criminal, you ask? Do you even know what the criminal did? Who is the criminal? Who is the criminal who will kill me now? Frederica Bernkostel. Despite Gimas, I can't read that whatsoever. Midsummer 1985. Oh, and one of you guys, um... <laughs> Kind of, um, point, you guys, uh, one of you guys said I did pretty good pointing out that, um, for some odd reason, Burncostel and Rika looked very, very similar. And, um, one of you guys kind of said, like, if you try to say Frederica fast enough, it sounds like you're saying Frederica. And I was thinking about that for, like, a moment. I'm like, holy shit. That's, that's pretty, that's pretty, um, coincidental, I guess. <laughs> but, uh, I don't know. I just thought that was pretty interesting. I had misread the time, ended up arriving too early. Yeah, we're back to these backgrounds. Been a while. <laughs> the schedule board flipped with a series of clacks. My flight to Sapporo was still a bit later on. I still had over an hour before boarding. Well, I might as well close my eyes for a bit on that bench over there then. I came here directly from work, so maybe the fatigue from that was making me sleepy. Okay, so this is not KG. Okay. Finding a suitable bench, I put my luggage on the suit next to me and settled down. Or the seat next to me. Goddamn, not the suit. Who just lays a suit down? Whew. 
I sighed like an old man. Oh, I'm sorry. Ugh. I had hoped to stay young forever, but it becomes splendidly middle-aged. Okay, so I'm some middle-aged guy. Apparently the rumor that even the people in the latter half of their 20s experienced a decline in their physical strength wasn't a lie. It had been mind-numbingly busy at work lately, so I really had any time to myself. This might have been the first time I'd been able to enjoy a journey like this since I, oh, since I was a student. The reason behind this trip was to meet with an old friend. It was a bit strange to call him an old friend. In fact, it might be better to call him a bad one. After retiring a couple years ago, he moved to Sapporo, his mother's hometown. His mother passed away soon after that, and he was now peacefully enjoying his second lease on life. His name was Kurada Oishi. Oh, goody! You're friends with Oishi. He was a former detective from the primary investigation unit at the station in Okinomiya Prefecture. To be honest, the only direct contact we ever had didn't last more than three days. After that, we exchanged New Year's cards, but never met again. So this would be the first time meeting him in seven years. In other words, we met seven years ago. In 1978. Hmm. There was something I just had to ask, to talk to him about concerning that time. To explain that, it was impossible not to recall the incident that happened back then. Hmm? That kidnapping, the details and resolution of which were resigned to darkness. Also, it was impossible not to recall a certain mysterious girl. Hmm? Reina, maybe? My name is Mamoru Akasaka. Okay. That's a neat name. It was a year that had been strangely hot, even though it was only June. Okay, so are we flashing back? Oh, the cicadas! Oh, how I did not miss you whatsoever. Early summer, 1978. Goodbye, teacher. Okay, bye. Watch out for cars. And don't drop in at a old friend's house along the way. Make sure you get your textbooks in order to tomorrow before you go to bed. The lively sounds of children running towards the hallway. Hmm. Hey now, didn't I tell you before? I already have one of those. I don't need any more. The unique, high-pitched voice of youth. The energetic shrill of the cicadas when completely unheard by their ears. Children returning home from school, split off one by one from their groups of friends as they went through intersections in the residential area. Even though there were several of them in a group as they left the school, as they got closer to their homes, their numbers dwindled. That's why the fewer friends you were walking home with acted as an indicator that you were that much closer to your destination. Later. See ya. Yeah, see you tomorrow. He finally parted ways with his last friend. Hmm? Who? A van was parked at a band in the road. The window was open, the sound of the radio leaking outside. It must have been the news or something. For that three, for that reason, the three of them were arrested for traffic violations and obstruction of justice. Due to the protests against the Hinamizawa Dam project resulting in bloodshed when clashing with riot police last month, things have only become more violent. The police are therefore taking precautions against radical activists causing yet another accident. Incident, sorry. Last week, there was also a direct confrontation with Minister Inugai on the steps of the Ministry of Construction. The boy's ears perked up at the mention of the name Inugai. At that moment, a man's face peeked out suddenly from the window of the van. His behavior was a little different than that of a man looking around to see if there was any on incoming traffic before he opened the door of his vehicle. His eyes meeting suddenly with the unfamiliar man, the boy panicked slightly. Nightingale. Okay. Skylark. Okay. They secured the two blocks around us. We're good to go. The man in the passenger seat whispered quietly, Oops! Nodding in acknowledgement, the man opened the door and stood before the boy. What's going on here? You. Are you Toshiki Inugai-kun? While asking that, the man peered at the boy's name tag. Toshiki Inugai. The name was written plainly there. Hmm? 
The phone rang for a third time. If he reached out, he could easily pick up the receiver. However, he was concerned that if he picked it up before it had even finished ringing once, whoever was on the other end of the line would think him a, che a fairly cheap person. That's why he normally never picked up the phone until the third ring. Even he thought it was a worthless habit. However, his thinking that there isn't much meaning in waiting for just three rings, wouldn't wait, wouldn't for waiting for five be all right, was very much a reality. His mind filled with such trifling thoughts, he picked up the phone after the third ring had finished, even though clearly it has been ringing for several times. It's a re it's reverb dampened by his action. Yes? Hello? Hello? He knew that sometimes due to a malfunction at the switchboard, calls didn't connect well. At those times, it was best to hang up and let the person on the other end call again. Thinking that, the moment he began to hang up the phone, he sensed that he was definitely connected after all. He felt the presence of the person on the other end of the line, keeping silent. Hello? There was no way they didn't hear his question. What was the meaning of this? It wasn't like he didn't know that people could use silent calls to harass others. However, he'd never received a call like that until today. Maybe he was just lucky before, but... He didn't believe that he would receive such a call on his phone. There were no direct calls to or from this line. Everything had to go through an operator. Therefore, there was absolutely no way the call would be connected unless it was verified there was somebody else on the other end of the line. That's why he didn't understand how to deal with this silent call, and instead settled into confusion. I don't know who you are, but if you have nothing to say I'm going to hang up. Please call again some other time. Intending that to be a parting line, he made to slam down the receiver. It was at that moment, the person on the other end spoke for the first time. You didn't say who you were, so I was anxious. If you're not Minister Inugai, please hang up right away. He couldn't help but be surprised by the extremely strange voice on the other end of the line. Was there a human alive who could speak with this hoarse and metallic voice? Oh, okay. I need to change that voice then. No, this was a voice he had heard somewhere before. That was the kind of voice that was on those low-brow documentaries that they'd use when they wanted to hide the identity of a speaker, wasn't it? Oh, I cannot, I cannot copy that. The voice he was hearing over the line was exactly like that. Who are you? As I said, that's what I want to ask. Are you Minister Inugai? He, Inugai, hesitated to answer. Unable to discern the intent of this suspicious phone call, he had a vague feeling that something was off. He thought about hanging up the phone and asking the operator who initiated the call. However, he forced himself to restrain that urge, and for the time being, chose to state his name and listen. That's right. This is Inugai. I said my name, now say you say yours. My name doesn't matter. First of all, Let's begin by thinking about the situation you're in right now. Right now, you're sitting in your chair talking on the phone, yes? Then why don't you try opening the lower drawer to your right? The lowest drawer to the right of the minister's chair. There was a lock on it, not enough to function as a safe. But nevertheless, it was a drawer that contained some valuable things. That's why Inugai thought that the person wanted some of the important information contained within that drawer. Sorry but I don't have any intention of opening that. I have no reason to follow orders from somebody who won't even give me his name. If you don't open that drawer, I'll hang up the phone. You will most likely end up regretting that. Why don't you think about opening that drawer first? Inugai didn't like following orders from this suspicious person one bit. However, he was concerned about what the man said about regretting it, so he decided to open the drawer. He took the small key he kept stowed in his wallet and unlocked the drawer. His, sta his hand stopped right before he opened it. What if there was a bomb inside, and it would explode if the drawer was opened? That delusion took hold of him. He quelled that instinct and opened it. Did you do it? The thing that's in there, do you know what it is? Th this is... What is the meaning of this? Hey! 
I don't think there's any need for me to explain, is there? I'll give you some time, so please, think about it a little. I'll contact you again later. Now then, pardon me. Hey! Wait! Hello? Hello! The call had already ended. That would not change no matter how much he yelled at it. Even still, Inugai, without realizing that, continued yelling into the receiver for a while. The drawer was still open. And what is inside? Well, on top of the folders, crammed into the drawer, it lay there. Toshiki Inugai. Written in plain lettering on a grade schooler's name tag. Just lying there. Enshrined there, completely out of place, as if it were cowering. <sighs> this is a work of fiction. Any resemblance to actual persons or organizations is entirely coincidental. That was an interesting start. I don't think any of the other Higurashis kind of had a start like that, except maybe the first one, Onikakushi. So are we going to go back to Keichi now? Hmm? Do you remember, Yuki? This picture. This is where I first proposed to you. That brief moment before you nodded back. You probably wouldn't know. Just how much it seemed like an eternity to me. Yes. I would have never thought that amount of time could feel like an eternity. Compared to how long I had to wait for you to propose to me, it was. <laughs> From the moment I met you until today. Compared to the time I've spent since I was born. It might only be a brief period, but... They were definitely precious, beautiful days that deserved to be called an eternity. That time continues even now. From now on. I wonder if it'll be a boy. Or maybe a girl. Either one is fine. A boy or a girl, either way it's living proof that we love each other. If it's a boy, we'll name it after you, Mamaru. If it's a girl, we'll put the Yuki from my name in hers. Thinking about names is so fun that in the end, we still haven't decided yet. There's still time to puzzle over it. Not that long of time, actually. You see, Yuki? There's something I have to apologize for today. It's my job. Sorry. It looks like an annoying bit of work has come up. In the worst case, I might not be able to be there for the delivery. It's fine. You have a very important job. What you do protects the way we live. Compared to you, it's nothing. Please. Oh, sorry. Please, go ahead. When you return, I'll be waiting here with our child. Thank you. Also, I'm sorry. Please don't apologize. If you feel guilty about it, then you can just atone. If I atone that much, no matter how much money I have, it won't be enough. <laughs> it's a joke. Now, go on. Hmm. As I left the room, I bumped into an elderly man. It was Yuki's father. In other words, my father-in-law. Father. I didn't want to intrude, so I waited in the hall. Uh, I didn't mean to eavesdrop, but I heard. Go. Yuki is that kind of girl. No matter what happens, she doesn't want to hold you back. I've forced Yuki to give up on so many things. To put her through this during childbirth, such an important time in her life, I'm ashamed. If you really feel that way, when you're done with your work, make some time for Yuki. She'll be happier with that than you passing your work off on someone else. Thank you. I know full well you do important work. Be proud in what you do. Yuki is looking forward to your triumphant return. Yes. Hmm. I jumped into the taxi that was waiting outside. Compared to the time when I first got here, the numbers on the fare meter had grown considerably. It seemed the modest time Yuki and I had spent together wasn't so modest from an objective point of view. Sorry to keep you waiting. Go ahead. No worries. Well then, off we go. The taxi jerked as it changed gears to accelerate. Soon bearing the hospital, my wife was in behind a throng of buildings. If it was to end up as a, tr a really troublesome ordeal, I probably wouldn't be returning for quite some time. To call a rookie like me, and on top of that, one who's off duty, it seemed that the section chief was calling for all hands on deck. 
The veteran upper brass gathering on an emergency basis happened occasionally. This was the first time, though, that I experienced everybody gathering together like this. Whatever was happening, there was no doubt it was going to be something novel. Right when my wife was ready to give birth, if I wanted to spend the time to curse my misfortune, I'd, I'd be here all day. Even the verdant ginkgo trees lining the street that always brightened my mood seemed to lack some of their usual luster. Hmm. Eventually, the government office came into view. Briefly holding my breath, I let the feelings of tension course through my body once again. I had to remember the work I was doing was important, necessary, and difficult. I composed myself and sharpened my wit. Ready? The taxi stopped in front of the building. Hmm. Kasumi Gaseki, Tokyo, Metropolitan Police Department, Public Safety Division. Chief, everyone's here. Akasaka-kun, could you close the blinds? The blinds were usually closed when they needed to use the projector, or if the discussion was going to contain some particularly disturbing content. Hmm. The blinds closed with a satisfying sound, darkening the interior of the room. Immediately, the inside of the room was completely drained of the pleasant morning atmosphere, leaving behind only the cold illumination of the fluorescent lighting. After the supervisor ensured that everyone was present, he nodded to the section chief once again. With everybody on the edge of their seats, the chief stood up solemnly and began to give his report. Approximately 48 hours ago, the Mesta of Construction's grandson, who is also the son of one of his staff leaders, is believed to have been kidnapped. It is believed the minister, in an effort to resolve matters amicably, chose not to report the situation to the police and plans to see to the demands imposed upon him. Okay. It seemed that approximately 48 hours earlier, the minister of Construction's grandson and those of his senior staff members were kidnapped. The reason why it was phrased that way was because the person in question didn't admit it had happened. Based on the results of surveillance conducted on the minister's residence, multiple suspicious phone calls from what is believed to be outside the city took place. The abducted child is said to be under treatment for some illness, but there's no trace of any hospital records or witnesses to such effect. Sorry. Due to that, and various other reasons, we believe without a doubt that a kidnapping has occurred. Here, they omitted the details that brought this incident to light. If you think about it a bit, that meant that before this incident happened, the minister's residence had been under surveillance already. I won't use the words spied upon. Of course, there wouldn't have been court approval for this, and it could have been very hard to explain for ordinary citizens. Two ordinary citizens, my bad. However, it was quite an effective method to catch words of incidents like this before they got worse. I'd like for you to understand that dealing with these cases before they become a problem is the job of the Public Safety Division. Why is he just following their demands instead of reporting this to the police? The fact that a minister can't even trust the police, what is the world coming to? It seems that the group of perpetrators demonstrated that they have quite a high level of surveillance on the minister themselves when they kid conduct the kidnappings. Enough to give the minister pause before calling the police. We'll find out right away if you call the cops, more or less. So it's possible that there's a mole close to the minister. Several of the higher-ranking members who seem to have experience with this kind of thing let out deep sighs. Hmm. The goals of the perpetrators, the demands, as well as this entire incident, are as of yet unclear. But in any case, the possibility that this may grow to threaten national interest is extremely high. If their goal was to simply have their demands met for monetary gain, that would have been nice. However, if this was some politically motivated shakeup, things would get a lot more complicated. Since we're not receiving any cooperation from the victim, that means that we're not privy to any of the details of the threats or demands. Due to the fact that we believe there may be a mole involved in this incident, this investigation is highly classified. Only the people in this room ought to know of this. Furthermore, as this case is our utmost priority, we'll be placing a hold on everybody's normal duties. Understood? After that, the supervisors continued on, tactfully explaining our course of action. If this incident were to become public, it was possible that the minister's poli political life would be over. I'll spare you the explanation of how the rest of the dominoes would fall, but in the end, support in the diet would decline. Followed by a no-confidence vote and a snap election. 
and it might even expand communist influences. Oh god, anything about the communists! In other words, we wanted to handle this delicately. Kawasaki and Saiki, monitor communications from the minister in the child's residence 24-7. Find out what the minister is doing. Report anything that happens. The remaining members, investigate whatever is related to the case as assigned to your units. Focus your line of investigation on the commies, reds, and confeds. Don't discount the possibility of foreign involvement either. I've experienced one or two unamicable situations before. This, however, was the first time I've seen things get so hectic. Several sophisticated conversations were progressing without the involvement of a rookie like me. I didn't intend to be timid, but I couldn't hide my confusion at this unfamiliar situation. And cover that. As for Akasaka-kun, I snapped back to alertness upon hearing my name called. Y yes You investigate the environmental groups that have petitioned the minister. Among them, there's that group protesting the Hinamizawa Dam project that made the papers. Make sure you investigate them thoroughly. I doubt this is the act of some citizen group, but we have to eliminate every possibility we can. Understood. So those opposed to the Hinamizawa Dam? It's probably best if you go to the location personally. Get some information from the local authorities. They're a fairly radical organization, so the public safety division there should have them mocked as well. Understood. I'll head over there. Your wife. She's almost ready to give birth, isn't she? I apologize for the timing of all this, but I'm counting on your cooperation. We can't take our time with this, so we just have to be so we just have to brute force it with our boots to the ground. Yeah, I know. My wife hates to interfere with my work with her own circumstances anyways. Sorry, and thanks. So then, as for Kawasaki-kun and Saiki-kun, to help support your- Hmm. Okay, at least- Okay, at least his captain was a little bit- Er, I guess his captain, I guess. Seemed a little bit understanding about the situation. Hmm. I didn't want to take a business trip when my wife was about to give birth. I don't blame you. Even if I was a little busy, as long as I was in Tokyo, I could head to the hospital right away. On assignment, though, that would be difficult. Even so, I knew the work I was doing was important, and fully understood that I was in no position to be so selfish. I'd have to make it up to my wife for having to be away at such an important time. My wife, Yuki, would probably forgive me with a smile. The only thing she could hate doing would be holding me back. My male ego, though, at least wished she would have tried to stop me. Sorry, Yuki. I don't mind if you always complain to our child that their father couldn't come to the hospital when you were born because he was too busy with work. Hmm. The next day, I took the bullet train to Nagoya and from there transfer transferred to the train to XX Prefecture. Getting to my destination by land took several hours. If I was traveling by air, in that amount of time I could probably get as far as Hong Kong. XX Prefecture was by no means close. I never sat in first class except for work, but whenever I did, the, seat, the seats seemed stiff. Closing my eyes, I mentally reviewed the documents I read yesterday. The group under investigation, the Onigafuchi Defense Alliance. They were a group of residents opposed to the development proposed under the Hinamizawa Dam project. The local protests were quite heated and were getting more radicalized. Even limited to what was written in the newspapers, there was bloodshed that occurred during a clash with riot police, interfering with the dam construction. Too many to count. The number of petitions, sit-ins, and direct appeals to the relevant organizations were innumerable. As an extension of that, there was a direct appeal to the Minister of Construction the other day. This was the reason why we were investigating this group in the first place. The land that they lived on was going to be submerged so it was no wonder they would go into a frenzy. Oh my, oh god, I just now realized it freaking clicked in my head. We're at the point right whenever, when the riots, or whenever uh, uh, Mion's and Shion's family was opposing the Hinamizawa Dam project. We're at this point, right? That, that's literally what's, oh, yeah, okay, so we actually get to see what actually happened. Cool. I mean, that could easily be a very, 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 very bad thing, but... Oh well, I'm just kind of happy that we're finally getting some information about this. 
Even given that though, could they really be capable of doing something like kidnapping the Ministry of Construction's grandson in order to halt the project? From my take on it, I had serious doubts. This kidnapping plot was extremely sophisticated and complicated enough that it was believed that there was some political backing. This wasn't something that could be pulled off by some group of local protesters. Well, just like the chief said, the plan was to eliminate all possibilities. While I'm in the XX police's reference room taking my time investigating the higher-ups in Tokyo... Oh, sorry. I read that too fast. While I'm in the police's reference room taking my time investigating, the higher-ups in Tokyo would probably solve the case. Without my involvement entirely. Even if that was true, I couldn't regret being away from Tokyo while my wife was ready to give birth. This was work. There was really nothing that I could do. Ding dong. The announcement that we would be arriving at our destination soon snapped me back to wakefulness. I'll take a drink of my coffee right now. Gagura Prefecture, Prefectural Public Safety Division. The Onigafuchi Defense Alliance. Yeah, they've been quite active around here. The Prefectural Public Safety Department already had the documents and a cup of tea ready and waiting for me. Oh, that was nice of them. The short of it is, they're a group of residents opposed to the dam. Really, it's probably better to say that every resident living on the land that's going to be submerged is rising to action, though. Like the old saying, fight to the last. They're a determined and well-prepared lot. It'd be nice if they drew the line at just being a moderate residential organization. The stack of papers they had prepared for me in the document room was by no means thin. At first, they were pretty much your average citizen's initiative, but... Ever since that incident with the riot police, they've really started to heat up. Now they've got a violent mentality on top of growing increasingly radical. Hmm. Violent organizations usually indicate ones that enforce their own ideology without regards to the democratic process. Breaking that down, many of these organizations held extreme left revolutionary ideologies. Considering that, I couldn't help but be surprised that a citizens group would end up going this far. Radical citizens movements happen occasionally. It seemed, however, that this group was nothing as trifling as that. It seemed that I would have to reconsider exactly what this Onigafuchi Defense Alliance was. I found a typo! The Defense Alliance's demand, in other words, the withdrawal of the dam project. How far would they go to have that demand met? The kidnapping of the minister's grandson was classified. That meant, of course, I couldn't tell the prefectural department about it either. As you know, there were arrests after last week's confrontation with Minister Inugai. There's enough reason to believe they could use illegal means to assert their demands. I skimmed over the list of the criminal records related to the Onigafuchi Defense Alliance recorded in the documents. The contents were all violent, not giving me the barest hint of a feeling that these people were trying to uphold the law. Uh, could you give me a basic rundown of the types of illegal, illegal activities the Onigafuchi Defense Alliance are engaging in? The chief opened up a manila envelope, fished out several or unorganized sheets, and spread them out on the desk. It seems that raids on the construction side are the most common. At first, they were committing relatively petty crimes like cutting power cords, jamming locks, and breaking office windows by throwing rocks. Of course, what really happened first were things like demonstrations, sit-ins, and distribution of pamphlets, lively but democratic forms of protests. However, then the demonstrators and police clashed, which started a riot, leading to numerous injuries and arrests. It was from then on that the Onigafuchi Defense Alliance, like the name implies, began to take a more demo demonish form of resistance. Don't you mean demonic? If the raids were frequent, didn't the lo- oh, I'm sorry. If the raids were frequent, didn't put local police up their patrols? Well, of course they were on full alert, but they were up against locals, you know. There wasn't much the police could do if they were sneaking around under the covers of darkness. You might as well label the entire map of Hinamizawa village around the dam construction site enemy territory. No matter how alert the police were, the locals would just show them exactly how easy it was to sneak around. Actually, it was after the police upped security that the protesters started getting ever more extreme, as though they were being provoked. 
See here? Can you tell how things started to heat up? An office set on fire. The destruction of heavy construction equipment. Destruction? They couldn't have used explosives? No way. You see, they crammed the gas tanks full of sugar cubes. Oh, that's not good. If they do that, it fouls the engines. Even in Japan, it seemed that there had been people doing that to the vehicles of occupying forces right after the war. Compared to misdemeanors like breaking windows, it was extremely violent and aggressive. After being toyed around with to that extent, the local, the local police have completely lost face. The arson was a bit much. After that, the local police drastically increased the number of personnel they had stationed around there around the clock. The raids on the construction site quieted down a bit after that. He used the words, quieted down, but that was still smack dab in the middle of the list of crimes. See? After that, they... After they found that attacking the site had become difficult, they started resorting to personal attacks. The first people targeted were the construction workers. Oh yeah. After that, there was silence. What was being described to me was a guerrilla war fought in the jungle. Threats and violence against the workers. Harsh words and harsher rocks thrown were thrown. There's quite a list of accusa- oh, sorry. <sighs> there's quite a list of accusations here, but there's not a whole lot of convictions. Of course not. First of all, there's no witnesses. On top of that, even if we identify the perpetrators, they have alibis coming out of the wood woodwork. Huh? What do you mean by that? Hmm. Take for example, you're walking around Hinamizawa, when a certain man stabs you with a knife. You remember the person clearly, and even know his name and address. However, the knife doesn't have any fingerprints on it, and there's no other physical evidence. Well, you'd think this would be a run-of-the-mill case of assault, wouldn't you? In Hinamizawa, though, it's a perfect crime. Everybody is... the entire village. They're all in on it. To protect the man who was the perpetrator, they'll get their story straight and prepare an alibi. To that end, they'll probably even forge some evidence. That's how scary Hinamizawa is, really. There's nothing they can do but put them on trial. On top of there not being any material evidence, though, people testify one after another to cover his side of the story. Any prosecutor would hesitate to file charges. I'm not sure about murder, but if it's something like opening a gash on somebody's forehead with a thrown rock, or relieving a bruise after hitting someone, even if you could single out the sub suspect, there's nothing reasonable. There's no. There's no. There's enough reasonable doubt to not convict. Every case is without a doubt perpetrated by someone in Hinamizawa, but they can't identify who. Even if they could figure out who it is, they're unable to obtain cer enough circumstantial evidence through due process. The villagers were all extremely well informed about this, and so the malicious, vicious, and tenacious personal attacks continued. That's honestly how dangerous freaking Hinamizawa is. I, I know I just repeated myself, but yeah, that village is really, really dangerous. The victims can't have been okay with that, right? Couldn't they have filed for an appeal? Well, you see, about that. Everybody on the inquest committee didn't want to get involved with something so troublesome. They won't stick their noses into anything related to Hinamizawa. Oh god, I gotta yawn. The inquest committee is comprised of a random selection of local residents. In the event the prosecutor fails to get conviction, they have the power to order a, a retrial. It's a system designed to assert the will of the people on the actions of expert prosecutors in the legal world. In this case, however, being composed of local residents has backfired. They don't want to get involved. Why is that? Hmm. Uh, how do I explain this? You could say they're afraid. Since it's a little special there. Special? Is it an outcast community? No, it's a little different from that. Well, just think of it as them being afraid. It's a little hard to explain it just now. Uh, oh, right. Uh, there is an easier way. Wiping his forehead with a handkerchief, he opened a file labeled as a list of members of the Onigafuchi Defense Alliance. The power of the Onigafuchi Defense Alliance, you see, is the fact that they count many people among their members who are influential in neighboring areas. Uh, could you take a look at this? I looked. What I saw startled me. Prefectural and Municipal Assembly members 
members, staff members of the Chamber of Commerce, an executive of a business association, an executive of a town council association, and a PTA liaison. There were more than a few people with a lot to, of say, both locally and in the neighboring regions. Around here, you could pretty much expect your actions to be observed by those against the dam project. If you said something in its support, who knows how it'd work out to your disadvantage. In any case, every town in this area is being held by the throat by somebody from Hinamizawa. The list of Inquisition Committee members is undisclosed, isn't it? There has to be some measures in place to make sure they'd avoid retribution, no? Well, it is undisclosed, so the privacy is assured, but... The person in charge of that is from the Okinomiya Municipal Office. In other words, a local. While you might expect some professional confidentiality, you can't know how everybody is connected. The people from Hinamizawa have a lot of tight bonds in that regard. When you consider the obligations and duties of people have to be have to the region, the web of information thereby formed is nothing to scoff at. It's not uncommon for housewives in a neighborhood to know which kid from which house is in what grade and what school, what subjects they're good at, and what vegetables they hate, among other things. You see, there's a Yakuza organization here with a strong ties to Hinamizawa and the surrounding area. It would seem that they've they're providing full support in those recent incidents. They seem to be proving most effective. Gangsters? Siding together with the residents opposed to the construction of the dam? It's a little hard to see what their common interest is. It's not that difficult at all. You see, actually, one of the lieutenants in that gang is originally from Hinamizawa. He was adopted into a rather influential family in the village. Exactly what was this Hinamizawa? The village of demons! I thought it was some desolate, rustic village. However, for some reason they exerted a strong influence on the surrounding areas and had a strong sense of unity. They would protect their village by any means necessary, even if that meant resorting to violence. The chief had said that they were afraid because there were numerous influential people living there. But somehow, I got the feeling that they were afraid of the village itself. There was something clearly different from what I had read in the documents in Tokyo. This was no simple residential protest against the dam. For some reason, an uneasy feeling began to nestle itself in the back of my mind. I chose the most basic way to ask my question. In other words, I directly asked what I wanted to know. Chief, this is just a hypothetical situation, but... Huh? This... Oni Gafuchi Defense Alliance. In order to halt the dam project, do you think they could say you could they could say threaten somebody important to accomplish that? The chief replied immediately. It's possible. Truth be told, they've already gone to municipal and prefectural offices as well as local offices of the Ministry of Construction and done things that could be construed as intimidation. Several of the workers' families have also reported that they're being followed around by some suspicious people. Okay. Well, that would make sense. To halt progress on the dam, they raided the construction site, destroying heavy machinery and lighting the construction office on fire. If they didn't have any qualms about doing that, threats and violence against people related to the dam would probably be no problem. But that was it. Even your everyday hoodlum could use threats and violence. However, this time it was the kidnapping of the minister's grandson, an abnormally high-level crime. Not only was pulling off the kidnapping difficult in the first place, but so was maneuvering to have the minister surround to their demands immediately. Surrender, sorry. There was no way this was the work of amateurs. Do these people have the power to enact this large of a crime? That was the heart of the matter. Was the Onikafuchi Defense Alliance an organization capable of pulling this off? In order to ask that question, once again, I chose the most basic method. Again, hypothetically, do you think they could kidnap a relative of someone of political importance? There's no way they could pull off something that big. That was the answer I most hoped for. If it was that answer, my work was as good as halfway done. I might be able to get back in time for my wife to give birth. That was how it was supposed to be. The chief, without a hint of res hesitation, replied. They just might. 
There's no telling how far they'd go. I'm sorry, Yugi. It seemed like my work wouldn't end so simply after that. Uh-oh, the phone is ringing again. Oh, Akasaka-kun. Good work. Oh. How's the information gathering at the prefectural office? It's coming along. It seems I'll be able to meet with their local public safety department. So I'm planning on heading out that way. How's the investigation in Tokyo going? The others are progressing along, but... The number of groups we have to investigate are countless. Time isn't really a luxury here. There were no new developments at this time. No matter how suspicious the Onigafuchi Defense Alliance was, if they solved the case in Tokyo, my job was done. It looked like my wishful thinking wouldn't come to pass. Hanging up the phone, I let my gaze drift outside the window to the valley of unfamiliar buildings. Okasaka-san, a car you can borrow just returned. I'll take you to it, so follow me. Ah, uh, thank you. He showed me the elevator to the underground parking lot where a battered sedan was waiting for me. That the steering wheel kept drifting to the left was a little concerning, but it would be enough to get me around for a while. My destination was Shishibone City, XX Prefecture, an area under the control of the Onigafuchi Defense Alliance. The Okinomiya Police Station was right on the front lines. Hmm. Okinomiya Prefecture. Shishibone City was, as far as provincial cities went, rather behind the times. Okinomiya Recess in the Mountains was even more remote. With little change between the seasons, all that was left was the tepid passage of time. It made for a rather drab town. There were no tourist attractions or local delicacies. Without even a strong regional industry, it was simply dull. Just looking at the monotonous and peaceful townscape, it was hard to catch a glimpse of the ra radical resistance of the Onigafuji Defense Alliance. The atmosphere of boredom didn't hint of the Okinomiya police station being on the front lines of the dam conflict, nor of the numerous incidents that I had heard about at the prefectural headquarters. Good morning. Are you here to pay a fine? Uh, no, I have an appointment with Matodai Sign from the Public Safety Division. Uh, please tell him it's Akasaka. Uh, my, my, my apologies. Uh, please wait a minute. The clerk, who I thought w I was here for a parking violation at first glance, after fumbling with, out with the unfamiliar extension number, told the person on the line they had a visitor. Uh, welcome, welcome. Uh, Akasaka-san, was it? Uh, it must have been tiring traveling all out this way. Uh, sorry, we have to do this here. I tried to reserve a reception room, you see. Uh, but the counselor suddenly woke up and chased me out. <laughs> I would hesitate to call where we were a conference room, as it was very small and cluttered. The cramped space was packed with lockers. I had the impression that it was more of a change room that doubled as one for smoking. Listening to his crude chortles, I didn't get much of a feeling that Matadai, who was head of the local public safety division, was much of an intellectual. But I knew that, in exchange, he had both experience and absolute confidence in his instincts. I apologize for interrupt- oh, I'm sorry. I apologize for interrupting you during such a busy time. I'm Akasaka from the Metropolitan Police Department. A pleased to make your acquaintance. Matsudai from the Public Safety Division. Nice to meet you. I was threatened by a Sankai from the prefectural gang buses to be generous with my cooperation. <laughs> gang busters? You mean the prefectural crime prevention division? You see, we're treating the Onigafuji Defense Alliance as an extension of the local Yakuza. You'd have to be a newbie if you think they're just a residential protest group. <laughs> they said the prefectural office, too, that the Onigafuchi Defense Alliance was linked to the local mob. If I recall correctly, the adopted son of somebody influential was a lieutenant in that gang. It's the other way around. The complete opposite. Oh, sorry, it's him again. The Yakuza put up the protest group as a front to justify their actions. Just think of it like that. Completely the other way around. Matsudai was just about rolling with laughter. This was slightly different than the info given to me at the prefectural office. 
but somebody embedded locally would be more knowledgeable. While we were talking, occasionally some people who seemed to be detectives would come in and change. One of those individuals, noticing Matarai's guffaws, came up to us. Hey, it's Oishi! Hey, buddy, how's it going? I was wondering what you guys were talking about. <laughs> oh, Kuro-chan! Perfect timing, why don't you join us? This here is Inspector Akasaka, who came all the way from the Tokyo Police Department. An inspector. I'm still a rookie. Uh, my name is Akasaka. Uh, pleased to meet you. It must be nice to be so fresh-faced. Did they hire you this year? <laughs> I couldn't help but think I was being ridiculed, so I only responded with a forced smile. I could tell that this new person was like Matadai, the type who had confidence in their instincts and experience. I really didn't like those types of people. Uh, let me introduce you, Akasaka-san. This is Oishi-kun from our investigation department. Uh, regarding the S-file you were asking about, he's familiar with it. S-file? S for Sonozaki. If something is an S-file, it means it has something to do with the Sonozaki family. It's something of a code name. Sonozaki? Come to think of it, I remembered when I was poring over the documents at headquarters, there were quite a few people with the last name Sonozaki popping up. If I remember right, uh, there's a Sonozaki who is one of the executives of the Onigapuchi Defense Alliance. I'm pretty sure they're the treasurer. The two of them were surprised when I riled off what post that Sonozaki held. After a moment, both of them erupted into laughter. Akasaka-san, was it? <laughs> You're quite the studious one. Could it be you've memorized all the central figures in the Alliance? <laughs> I, I wouldn't say memorized, exactly. But I've at least read the list of Onigafuchi Defense Alliance executives. <laughs> then, who are the president and vice president? The president is the mayor of Hinamizawa, K. Kimiyoshi. The vice president is the priest of the local shrine, Furude. The treasurer is O. Sonozaki. The auditor is Makino. The liaison is Y. Kimiyoshi, and the PR head is E. Sonozaki. <laughs> Akasaka-san, you're pretty good. The base sucks, but you want to work here? You're just the type we're looking for. By the way, Yoshio Sonozaki is head of the youth department. So close. The head of public relations is actually Tadayoshi Sonozaki. <laughs> Feeling like I wasn't being complimented at all, I started settling into an uncomfortable mood. I think everybody gets a little uncomfortable when Oishi appears. However, I was becoming more and more aware that I was in the weakest link in this investigation so I just had to bear with it. I didn't mean for that feeling to show up on my face, but the crafty detectives didn't let that slip by. <laughs> I didn't mean to make fun of you. To make up for it, why don't I show you around the village? For somebody with no feel for the area like me, it would be of great help. I couldn't have asked for more. In the end, the Onigafuji defense lines is nothing more than alias Namizawa just to deal with the outside world. I think getting to know the village would speed up your work. Hmm. How about it? The residential movement, in other words, held influence over the whole region. So the leader of the movement was the leader of that influence. Just like that, the thought processes in the region would become the overall personality of the movement. Just like Oishi had said, in order to learn what they were really like, this regional force behind the dam protests gained to know the village was the quickest way. If you would. Nodding back without skipping a beat, Oishi laughed in satisfaction and stood up. I don't recognize this music. This must be whenever the more music actually was being made. If I took the information I learned at the prefectural office and from Matadai to heart, if my position was exposed, my personal safety was at risk. The opponent was an extremist group that had no qualms about using threats or violence against somebody. If my personal info was leaked, it wouldn't be hard to imagine that I'd be in danger, whether on the job or not. Thinking that, I felt a little nervous. These guys are quick to remember faces. Oh. If you're seen with me, I'd probably do a lot to hinder your work. This might be a little cliche, but put these on. Oishi handed me an incredibly suspicious disguise compromised of a baseball cap, sunglasses, and a mask. I didn't want to get all hot and stuffy, but Oishi's warning was probably right on the money. Considering that, I put them on with appreciation. 
I looked so suspicious that Oishi had to smile wryly. How much did I tell you again? Let's see. Uh, to the part where you were talking about how these three ancient families control the village. The Onigafuji Defense Alliance was the same as the village of Hinamizawa itself. Meaning that there was a direct correlation between being executive in the Alliance and being a leader in the village, as Matadai had told me a short time ago. If the village was ruled by three ancient families, then it would mean that the Onigafuji Defense Alliance was ruled by those same three families. What did the documents at the prefectural office say? About the leader of the Defense Alliance or whatnot? Oh. Oh, that was Oishi asking, okay. The documents I was using were classified. If I responded to Oishi's question, it'd be a breach of security. However, most likely, this man I judged was more well-versed in the situation than any of the documents at that prefectural police department, so I decided to answer him. Uh, that the president of the alliance is the current mayor of the village, Kirichiro Kimiyoshi. Oishi, upon hearing that, let out a small chuckle. For him to ask like that, and to answer at the question as it was recorded in the documents, meant that wasn't the case in reality. So then, that means there's somebody else other than Kimiyoshi behind the scenes. Contrary to what the prefectural office thinks, or rather, what is commonly known. Oh. <laughs> Old man Kimiyoshi is nothing more than a figurehead. In the first place, the post of mayor in that village is nothing more than ceremonial. In other words, there's something else in charge of both the alliance and the village? Would that be the three families we just talked about? Well, I'll explain that part right now. All of a sudden, with a thunk, the car suddenly lurched. The paved road had given way to a gravel one. At the same time, the scenery outside the window changed. The Hinamizawa Dam project must be withdrawn. Overthrow the shameless puppet of a governor. The dam will submerge the natural beauty of Hinamizawa. Protect the village from unethical dam. Fear the wrath of Oyashiru-sama's curse. Oh god, it's back! Demolish the dam. Those involved must go away. The construction office must respond. The office manager must negotiate with us. Signs and banners crowded the roadside. Even reading the brush-scrawled words was daunting. It was as though where the road just changed was a border with a different country. At that moment, I was startled by the car suddenly breaking. Looking ahead, a barricade had been erected. About five or six protesters, wearing masks and helmets to hide their faces, were blocking the road, yelling at us to angrily to stop. What is this? A checkpoint? Hmm. These guys never learn. We just snorted as he rolled down the window and leaned out. Hey, hey, hey! Guys, you can't be blocking the road like this here! As Oishi glared at them with a malicious laugh, they visibly faltered. Clear the way. We can't get by like this. <laughs> Who would have thought it was Oishi's car? That panicked thought seemed to make them lose their presence of mind. Uh, uh, if we had known it was your car, Detective Oishi, we wouldn't have been so rude. Uh, Detective, uh, what happened to your usual car? Is it in for maintenance? Something like that. I just can't get used to this car they loaned me. <laughs> Judging from their brief conversation, I could guess that they were familiar with the license plate of the car Wishy normally used. In other words, if they knew the car belonged to the police, they would have hidden the barricade. What they were doing was obviously obstruction of traffic. A blatant crime. Uh, who's that suspicious guy? You could- You! Could you show us your face? The man glared at me menacingly, wearing a mask and sunglasses made me look particularly dubious. Would not showing my face get me into some unnecessary trouble? I turned to Oishi to see what I should do. Give him a break. He's still a shy little rookie. We just wanted to make sure he wasn't somebody anybody suspicious. Hinamizawa has been in a bit of a stir as of late. <laughs> Have you looked at yourself in the mirror? That mask you're wearing is way more suspicious. <laughs> the men in Oishi continued to talk like that, feigning smiles at one another. However, from the beginning to the end, I couldn't get over the feeling I was sitting on a powder keg. Have the number of trucks illegally dumping still not decreased? It's a real hassle dealing with all the time. If the police could understand and cooperate, would really, it would really help. <laughs> During that conversation, the barricade has moved, leaving a gap wide enough for a single car to get through. 
Oishi lightly honked the horn once and began to roll the car forward. I could see the men's antagonistic glares at the back of the car in the rearview mirror. Hmm. What was that just now? Blocking a public road like that? Of course it's a crime. Still, if you get worked up over that, it'll never end. Those guys, see, claim there's an infestation of trucks illegally dumpling in the village. The story goes that in order to stop that, they're halting suspicious vehicles for inspection. Illegal dumping? Like corrupt contractors just tossing industrial waste away? Their line of argument is that if the police aren't going to do anything about it, they'll take matters into their own hands. Well, the industrial waste is just something they're doing by themselves anyway. But by themselves? They have a pretty good strategy. You see, in order to hinder construction, they've spread industrial waste all over by the dam site. Then, blaming on corrupt contractors, they start instituting these inspections. There, they stop every construction vehicle coming through and interfere with them as much as possible. So then, it's one of the methods the Onigafuji Defense Alliance is using. With that inspection just now, this car's license plate has probably been recorded. It shouldn't get stopped from here on out. Those guys know very well not to get me angry. <laughs> See, rumor is that, that they figure a car was laid to the construction in some way. Not only would there be checkpoints stopping it at every turn, but they'd be throwing rocks and planting road spikes as well. It's best you be careful so you're not identified. If they find out you're from public safety, who knows what you'll suffer through. <laughs> I wish he was acting like they were we were talking about something fun, but for me it was no laughing matter. It almost feels like we've wandered into a civil war in the Middle East. <laughs> That's a good way of putting it. It's a pretty much it's pretty much just what you said. We should turn to me with a grin and menacing laugh. Hmm. You see, this is a war zone. The car slowed down a bit as it went down a narrow road through some farmland. You see that house in the forest over there? That antiqu antiquated one? Looking at where Oishi was pointing, there certainly was an old, traditionally designed house. That belongs to the mayor, old man Kimiyoshi. You could say it belongs to the main Kimiyoshi house as well. There's a lot of branches, but they'd be of one of the three families. The three families? The ancient families that control Hinamizawa? That's right. And one of the others is the Furude family. Their house doesn't even have a single branch. All that's left is the head priest's family. Right over there. Oh, sorry. Right over there. There is the shrine. He's the priest there. By the way, the Defense Alliance's office is on the grounds of that shrine. The office of the Onigafuchi Defense Alliance. If these guys were the enemy, that would make the shrine their stronghold. Uh, can we go look over there? The shrine is the Ferude family's private property. You see. Being police, we can't set foot there without a warrant. See, they got a member of the Diet with the ties to the village backing them up. Basically, being the police has its strengths and weaknesses. Well, even when we talk about the free families, that's something from a long time ago. Way back when, those three families used to hold councils to decide things about the village. Meaning it's different now? You've got a pretty good nose. That's what I expect from an academic. <laughs> the car braked to a halt with a squeal. Ahead of where we were stopped were several signs. Private property beyond. No trespassing. Beware of poisonous snakes. Danger. Turn back. Intruders will be charged an entry fee of 1 million yen. Signs were erected there with things like that written on them. The road was separated from the forest by a chain link fence wrapped in a barbed wire. Since it's a private property, this is as far as we go. There's several surveillance cameras set further in. Saying that we just got lost won't work with these guys. They're beyond here, right? The people currently controlling Hinamizawa and the Onigafuji Defense Alliance were neither the Kimiyoshi family, nor the Furude family, but the last of the three. Yeah. Beyond here is one of the three families, the Sonazaki family. They're the ones controlling Hinamizawa from the shadows. Among the list of executives recorded in the documents, the number of people with last names from the three families was quite high. Of course, Sonizaki was no exception. However, at the top was the Kimiyoshi family. 
If the Kimiyoshi family seemed to be in charge, the rulers behind the scenes were the Sonazaki family. This double-layered structure implicitly told me that this village had both a light and a dark side. Hmm. The current head of the Sonazaki family is an old lady named Oryu. She has enough clout that you could call her Empress Sonazaki. Be careful, she's no small fry. She's enough of a VIP that even the mayor of the city has to bow before her. Well, any Namizawa in the surrounding area, the relatives amount to a block of several thousand votes. No politician could show disrespect for that. <laughs> in other words, that would make her the actual leader of the Onigafuchi Defense Alliance, right? You've got it. With those words, Oishi pulled out a well-worn cigarette box. The suspected kidnapping of the minister's grandchild and subsequent threats. Were these part of the hidden plot by the Onigafuchi Defense Alliance in order to have the Hinamizawa Dam project cancelled? You came all the way from Tokyo to investigate this, didn't you? Huh? Uh, yeah, uh, that's right. Uh, something the matter? Huh, then. Is it related to that direct appeal incident with the Minister Inugai? If that's the case, then public safety has them mocked on a watch list. Something like that? <laughs> Having you guessed that so quickly makes this easy. While exhaling out cigarette smoke, Oishi smiled broadly, like I just pulled a good one on him. Or so I thought. His smile disappeared suddenly. I still see it. That's a lie, isn't it? Huh? I mean, that direct appeal putting them on a watch list. That's a lie, isn't it? Oishi knew there was no way the Tokyo HQ would dispatch an investigator over something as minor as that direct appeal. If they were to dispatch someone, it had to be for a more dire reason. He had figured that out as much. I thought of myself as the type of person who didn't let things show on their face. In front of his watchful gaze, however, I felt that was what I was thinking was completely laid bare. Oishi silently lit another cigarette, as if waiting for me to interject during this awkward pause. I see. So this was a veteran's detective's way of getting someone to spill information. But as long as I realized this, there would be nothing more. If I didn't open my mouth, I wouldn't have to lose anything. All I had to do was stare out the window and enjoy the scenery until Oishi gave up. <laughs> you really are bad at hiding things, you know. Being so young and earnest isn't so bad. Oishi smirked as he twisted out his third cigarette while I tried not to let him notice that I had yielded completely. At first I thought I had won, but at the very least Oishi had ascertained that I was hiding something. Meaning that I might have ended up marching to his tune. Oishi started up the engine once again and began to move the car. If you'd just been honest with me, I thought I might have been able to help you. How would you help? If the cab was out of the bag, I might as well use it to catch some mice. Well, this depends on what we're talking about. But I might be able to set you up with someone who's knowledgeable about the goings-on in Hinamizawa. An informant? <laughs> I see. Is that what you call it? Why are you interested in my case, Oishi-san? Well, I'm the same as you. Isn't it our business to know things? Being able to meet with Oishi's informant was an extremely compelling opportunity. We were looking to recruit somebody familiar with the area to collaborate with for intelligence. In the end, there was no better method for finding people than asking. We were always taught, however, that the rank and file police were no better than monkeys. Unlike us, they were careless with confidential cases. We looked down on them like they'd run their mouth off in a drug and steward. Oishi was an outlaw, even amongst them, and here I was lost on whether or not I should tell him about the kidnapping of the minister's grandson. This informant, exactly how knowledgeable are they about the Onigavuchi Defense Alliance? <laughs> if you're from public safety, you would know, wouldn't you? Something like that is something I can't just tell you. Protect your sources. That was the first principle of dealing with confidential information. In that regard, it seemed that Oishi wasn't one of those monkeys. Should I trust him? Ask for his help? Or not? It's just that you work for the feds, and I work for the prefecture. I don't think that our jobs are that different. I think I can be of help. However, I had trouble believing that this crafty old man would simply help me just like he claimed. 
I find it hard to believe that someone of your standing would help me out without strings attached. <laughs> well, it's not like I'm completely un without an ulterior motive. As I recall, you guys have space in your budget allocated to pay informants, right? Something you don't need to submit a receipt for. Just a little bit of that would be the cost of meeting with the informant. In other words, give the compensation earmark for the inform informant to you, uh, to you first. Well, it helps that the details of this uh, this deal are so clear cut. He certainly was something else for he sorry. He certainly was something else for being able to brazenly state his ulterior motive like this. Rather than him doing this out of the kindness of his heart, everything was a lot clearer if he was being compensated for this deal. I felt that he was the type of man who was good at these backroom deals. Don't misunderstand me, please. It's not me who needs the money, it's the informant, okay? Well, in regards to the payment, I'll be handling the money. <laughs> when do you want it? Right now would be good. If you don't have it on you, tomorrow works as well. I pulled out a wallet that was different from my personal one. The price was pretty much fixed depending on what kind of information I was paying for. In this case, the payment was up front. Also, considering the fact I didn't know what kind of info I would get, I shouldn't pay too much. When I suggested that, we just suddenly stretched out his hand and tightly grasped the contents of the wallet. At times like this, it's best to not be so stingy. It's alright, it's alright, it won't go to waste. I understand. I won't be stingy. And? What kind of information are you looking for? Depending on what you want, how we approach this will probably change. You swear you won't spread this information to anybody else? Oh, he's on. I can't swear as much. I'm the same as you. I can't withhold information obtained during the course of my duties. <laughs> I got it, I swear. Nothing here gets said anywhere else. On top of that, thanks to you, I can pay back what I owe for my Mahjong debts. In any case, I won't break a promise that involves money. I was still unsure if I should trust him until the very last moment, but in the end I broke down. Oishi wasn't the type of guy I could trust 100%, but there was no mistaking he had access to underground information networks. In order to accomplish my mission swiftly, I needed his cooperation. I set my resolve. I'm investigating whether or not the Onigafuchi Defense Alliance is related to a certain incident. A certain incident? There's a possibility that the Minister of Construction, Inugai, is being coerced by someone. Saying there's a possibility is kind of a roundabout way of putting it. It appears there's a mole close to the Minister. And due to that mole, the Minister had been monitored quite thoroughly, and was seemingly forced to see to their threats right away. None of this was reported to us or the police. I see. So that's why you're saying there's only a possibility he's being coerced. In that case, isn't it a little strange? If the minister didn't report this to anybody, how'd you guys know about this incident? If we didn't spy on the minister's private life, we would have never found out. I don't think we have to provide that explanation to the informant, so I'm omitting it. I wish I had apparently caught on and quietly chuckled when I refused to explain. I see. There's a spy close to the minister, so public safety made it a highly classified information investigation. That certainly isn't a very amicable story, is it? If this matter became public, not only would this affect the minister's political career, but the possibility of there being a shift in the political landscape is extremely high. If the perpetrator's aim is indeed that, then this could develop into a very grave situation. Well, with the government having development projects all over the country, they butted heads with quite a few people. It wouldn't take much wrongdoing from the left-wing party to suddenly gone a more support. We're current. Oh, sorry. We're currently investigating what demands are being forced on the minister. But at least we have a good idea of how he's being threatened. Sorry about that. I had to go get myself a drink. Honestly, I forgot how much I actually read in this when there's no voices. How? The, the minister's grandson was kidnapped. They're denying it, but judging from when he was last seen, it's believed it's already been over 72 hours since the kidnapping. So, three days. If they were just after ransom money, this would have been settled by now. And maybe this isn't for monetary gain. The possibility that they're forcing the minister to do something politically is extremely high. That's something we just can't consent to. So then, the Onigafuji Defense Alliance was listed as one of the possible perpetrators. That is correct. 
kidnap the minister's grandson and demand the cancellation of the dam project. Hmm. What do you think, Oishi-san? From your point of view, do you think that's possible? Oishi seemed to ponder the idea for a while. The section chief at the regional office had responded immediately with, It's possible. However, Oishi, who was this well informed about the matter, was hemming and hawing. Finally, just a little bit, he said something that was really just a little bit strange. This was before the Meiji era, you see. This area wasn't named Hinamizawa back village back then. It was called Onigafuchi. <laughs> this is just what I heard from my grandmother. The topic was so completely and suddenly unrelated to the subject of the kidnapping of the minister's grandson that I was taken slightly back. Onigafuchi. Oh, so that's why they're called the Onigafuchi Defense Alliance. You see, the village of Onigafuchi was said to be inhabited by demons that devoured humans. Even now, it's believed that the blood of these demons partially courses through the veins of the villages. D demons that devour humans? Oishi-san, uh, what are you saying? It's information. I got a lot from you just now. A little too much. In exchange, I'm giving you a little freebie. Oishi finally smiled, but it didn't seem like he was fooling around. Um, please continue. You see, these human-devouring demons. Normally they were revered as Taoist transcendents and lived tucked away from the rest of the world. But they ate people, after all, so apparently they'd go to villages in the foothills regularly and abduct their prey. They used to call that being Demoned Away, or Onikakushi. Demoned Away. It was the first time I heard such a peculiar phrase. Really, it's the fourth time I've heard it! Well, actually, I've heard it so many times I've lost count. However, I felt something slightly ominous from this horrifying tale of demons abducting people in order to eat them. You look, uh, you know how there's a common phrase, spirited away? When people suddenly go missing one day, they call it that. When the same thing happens around here, they call it being demoned away. Uh, how does that old tale relate to the matter at hand? Oh, no. There's no direct relationship. I'm just making some small talk here. It's just... Kathump, kathump. The car shook. At some point, the gravel road had changed to a paved one. It's just... Just what? That around here, the phrase, demon away, is somewhat of a code for disappearances and kidnappings. I just thought I'd mention that. I don't know if this has anything to do with the kidnapping of the minister's grandson. Well, there's no deep meaning behind it. It's just, there's a little bit, that's, there's that little bit of history. Oni Kakushi, human-eating demons coming down from the, to the foothills and abducting their prey. Then, in order to cancel the dam project that threatened to submerge the village they lived in, did they demon away the minister's grandson? Then, had they already made an example out of the minister's grandson and eaten him alive? <laughs> It's a bit of an interesting old tale, isn't it? If you set foot into the demon's village without reason, you'll probably... Oh. If you set foot into the demon's village without reason, you'll promptly be captured and eaten alive. So don't go near Onigafuchi. Kids these days wouldn't have those superstitions, would they? Even among the older folk in Okinomiya born in the Meiji era, there's quite a few who wouldn't heed these warnings. Hinamizawa was feared by the people in the area. I recalled that piece of information I heard from the Prefectural Public Safety Division. In, in any case, we're in the boonies out here. It's kind of expected that there'll be some superstitions around. <laughs> I can't do the laugh in that voice, good lord. Somebody from Tokyo like you, Akasaka-san, probably couldn't even begin to imagine it, could ya? The man-eating demons, as the price for violating the sanctity of their village, kidnapped the minister's grandson and swallowed him whole. That ludicrous idea flew through my mind, my head. It was so absurd, I was half disgusted with myself. Oishi was just teasing me. Stupid. It was all really so stupid. Come to think of it, by then I may have already been seized by the curse of that dubious village. For me to realize that would take a little more time. Oh. That is most pleasant to hear. 
All right, the end of the first part. Unless it decides to continue. Come on, I have any new tips? Yes, oh my goodness, we have quite a few this time. The chick in the trunk, holy shit. Land of the demons. Oh, is that my face? Huh, I look weird. All right. Phone call with Yuki. A record of opening remarks. Gears and fire and the taste of honey. It looks like it just looks like blood. The chick in the trunk. Okay, let's go with phone call. Oh, really? It's tough when it's such a sudden assignment. Please be careful. Where are you headed? You're already there? Whenever I headed out on assignment, she would ask where. And not just Yuki, but anybody would have asked the same question. Okay, so it's through my... Okay, so it's through this guy's perspective. Okay. If it was a cold place, she would urge me to pack a thick jacket. If it was far, she'd warn me to be careful on the drive over. It was just normal, everyday concern that led to asking such an obvious thing. I felt sad that I couldn't answer such a run-of-the-mill question. Sorry. It's something you can't talk about, isn't it? But please be careful. I'm sorry, Yuki. At some point, you started apologizing right away. Even, th even though when you first started your job, you were all gung-ho about it. <laughs> Yuki laughed as though she had realized something. At times like this, Yuki had the magical power to see right through me. It's already been quite a while since I was admitted to the hospital. Are you finally getting lonely? T -t Don't tease me! I I'm too old to get lonely. <laughs> oh, really? You actually like to be doted on, don't you? Don't you start getting a little faint of heart when I'm not around? <laughs> ah, jeez. I can see the little devil horn sprouting from your head right now. You've always been like this. You can't hide it, you can't hide it. If I don't play with you, you get all lonely. I can hear your tail wagging over the phone. <laughs> the sight of Yuki wasn't something you could guess existed from seeing her usual modest behavior, and it was something that she didn't show to anybody else but me. Normally I'd poke her to hide my embarrassment and bring it into the conversation, but I couldn't do that over the phone. Of course, Yuki was clever. She was teasing me because of that. <laughs> I wonder when I figured out that giving you grief was this much fun. Give me a break. In any case, it's good to hear you so lively. I know, right? Did I cheer you up? I had called Yuki to keep her from feeling lonely when she was by herself in the hospital room. Of course, that was nothing more than a pretense that I, being shy, had come up with. It seemed that Yuki had long since been seen through that act. Yeah. Please phone again. When I'm not feeling up to it, I'll get my father to talk with you. Although, if you're talking with my father, I get the feeling that you'd be standing at attention on the other side of the line. <laughs> For a while longer, Yuki kept teasing me without letting me on the call. <laughs> that was nice. A record of opening remarks. Chairman XX. Members of the XX party. Congratulations are due, as we are celebrating 25 years since our founding. These past 25 years have, been, have seen much growth in Prefecture. The once quiet scenery of nothing but fields now has seen, has seen the opening of a new stop for the bullet train. And with the development of the highway, we've seen the rebirth of a modern city bursting with youthful energy. We've reaped the benefits of new businesses and industry. And with the special references the residents of XX Prefecture have for time-honored traditions, History and culture, business and industry, with these ideals in harmony, they have accomplished in growing their city into one of the Japan's foremost metropolises. Of course, the development of FX Prefecture couldn't have happened without the growth of the XX Party. We are resolved to see every one of our campaign promises to fruition, reaching our targets definite, definitively and expediently like arrows fired from a bow. With these arrows as the fundamental basis of the XX Party, our members have sought to pierce the obstructions preventing the happiness of the residents of Prefecture. But I do believe that everybody here is unlike an ordinary arrow. While being as unfaltering and straightforward, we have not neglected in seeking solutions that conform to the current day and age, while also keeping an eye on the future. An arrow, once loosed, can only fly to its destination. <coughs> Sorry about that, I caught something in my throat. 
Everyone here, however, is no simple arrow. Even once loosed from the bow, without neglecting our studies, while employing new methods, and implementing more effective and flexible ideas, thus being able to change trajectories mid-flight, we are magical arrows. The modern age marches ever forward. Sometimes it marches faster than the time taken from planning to execution. The following part was not in the script. It is thought to have been ad-libbed by the minister. For example, there have recently been numerous problems with the Hinamizawa power plant project. Rather than forcing through the project solely because it was decided upon by the government, it is necessary to reflect on and adjust to the ever-changing needs of the residents, the region, and the next generation. The protests by the local residents that surround the Hinamizawa Dam, these are also the will of the people of Exec Prefecture. If you feel that there is no need to listen to because the project has been already been finalized, then you do nothing more than shed poor light on Japan's post-war democracy. The following is as per the script. For the lasting happiness of the citizens of Japan and the residents of Exec Prefecture, Please consider these policies thoroughly. I believe, however, we have all gained something from the flexibility and foresight of the XX party. I've taken up much of your time. However, allow me to say the following to celebrate the 25th anniversary of our founding. Chairman, members of the XX party in attendance, thank you very much for today. From the opening remarks of the XX party prefectural forum and 25th anniversary celebration. Okay... Gears and fire and the taste of honey. Hmm. Ooh, creepy music, my favorite! The world is filled with people blessed with relationships. Of course, that doesn't mean that everyone is connected to each other. It's obvious that on the other side of the planet, there are people laughing and crying who can't possibly have an effect on you. However, in the extremely limited community of the neighborhood, that sort of connection is just a matter of fact. It's quite possible that a single remarkable event could have massive consequences inside a small community. If you were to increase that in scale, a perfect stranger on the other side of the globe might become enough of a legend to have an effect on our lives. Well, it's not always that way. Like I said at the beginning, the links between people basically aren't just that relevant in the grand scheme of things. Whether some household nearby is having steak or croquettes doesn't matter to me. When I put on my shoes, it doesn't matter to anybody whether I put the right one on, first or the left. This much, the average person can understand. But actual, in reality, this is the truth. The bonds between people are quite well defined. It's not just a matter of distance, of being far or near. For example, Let's say that Person A's actions have some effect on me. Even then, Person B's actions could have absolutely no consequences on my life. The reverse also holds true. Just because my actions affect Person A, that doesn't always mean that they affect act Person B as well. Let's put it bluntly, if the bonds between people are like gears in a machine, the gear that represents me meshes with some people, but is isolated from others. There are some who would try arguing against this. Those people would bring up the example of gears in a clock. Each gear indeed only directly meshes with one or two others. However, if you rotate one gear, the next one to it is moved, which connects to the next one and the next. In the end, all the gears are moving. There is a logic behind this. More than enough to convince the average person. Why is the argument convincing? The answer is simple. The relationships between people are ambiguous and can only be described conceptually. How the gears are connected and how their movements are chained together can't be used as a fundamental explanation, so it throws a wet blanket on that argument. So for the people who like that explanation, I use the example of a clock again to refute it. I, 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 I have like this imagination that somebody's snobbiest, that's why I'm kind of like um, talking like this, I don't know. First of all, to say that this world is a singular clock would be wrong. That is, there isn't only one clock. There exist many clocks in this world, each counting their own time. If you think about it, the idea that this world is just one big clock is the height of arrogance. Even if you use the analogy of gears to explain human relationships, then you should be able to explain it using an analogy of uh, multiple clocks unrelated to a single gear. Neighbors A and B. A is a gear in the same clock as me. So it's best to remain civil. B 
B is a gear in a different clock, so it doesn't really matter to me at all. That's the kind of clear distinction I'm talking about. You want to say I'm being fallacious? Fallacious? Then let's change the analogy to something more familiar so you can understand. You've probably heard the phrase, a fire on the opposite shore sometime in your life, no? For example, if your neighbor's house is on fire, you'd probably try and help to put it out, wouldn't you? It'd be awful if the fire spread and burned down your own house after all. But what if that fire was in a town on the opposite side of a river? Would you still go out of your way to help? You wouldn't, would you? Even though it'd be the wrong thing to do, there's no way the fire could spread to your own house. Even if it turned into a huge conflagration, there's no relationship between the houses that will spread fire to yours and those that won't. With this basic example, you should be able to see the difference between gears that are and aren't related to your own. Having said that, there's still a lot to think about, even without a river to divide it. After all, it's not a special problem like being on the other side of the river, is it? Huh. Okay, the one I'm most curious about now. The chick in the trunk. The car had stopped. But he didn't know any more than that. For not only was he blindfolded, but locked in the trunk of the car. How could people become this powerless just by being robbed of their sight? He absolutely wouldn't have known this without experiencing it firsthand. He soon realized it was pointless to try and undo his bonds, with the confines of the trunk suddenly make, quickly making him lightheaded. He had no choice but to let this mild torture dull his senses. That's why, when the car stopped and the unpleasant vibration ceased as the engine was killed, he couldn't help but dilute himself that he was being set free, even though nothing had been resolved in reality. Of course, he was soon removed from that delusion. He strained his ears when he heard one of the men who had abducted him and an older man he was hearing for the first time strike up a conversation. Nice to see you. The chick is in the trunk. He struggled so much that he's probably exhausted right now, but there's not a mock on him, just as ordered. Oh, must have been a handful. The trunk opened, letting in a blast of fresh, cool air. Even though up until now, just... Just now, he had been thinking about getting out of that stuffy trunk. When it was actually opened, he suddenly became uneasy. Even so, that he wished that the lid of the trunk would once again close, separating himself from them. Suddenly, somebody stroked his head. Of course, since he was blindfolded, he couldn't tell if the hand was petting him or simply evaluating how easy it would be to remove his scalp. Unable to tell the difference, he could only freeze as he imagined the worst-case scenario. Poor little bugger. He's shaken. Just stay calm for a bit. The older man said that kindly as he gently stroked the boy's head. This must be real tough for you. But you see, your Gramps is a nice man. He'll help you out soon enough. Having heard nothing but the average standard dialect his whole life, the older man's distinct intonation left a deep impression on the boy. But he had no idea what he was saying. For your Gramps to register his meaning, your grandfather took a while to process. Eventually, the hand that was stroking his head loosened the blindfold. Can't keep his eye covered. If he spits, if he splits his face open, it'd be bad. Hmm. And with that, we might as well take out that gag. It kept breathing like that. It can't breathe like that. It'll be trouble if he yells. Leave him to us. Jeez, you guys don't know how to treat somebody. The main family said no rough stuff. You better remember that well. Yeah. We won't do anything stupid. As long as the kid cooperates, that is. The man's head prouded roughly and repeatedly at the boy's head. A rugged hand, unlike the affectionate one that had been stroking his head before. Just stay cooperative. If you struggle, there's no guarantee what will happen. That cliched threat was literally beaten into his head. What the fuck? You're gonna leave it... Yeah, I should have expected he was gonna leave it there. Okay... So, okay, obviously I'm going to let you guys know I'm still going to try to get, um, I'm going to try to find some way to get the patches because I really want to hear the voices for all these characters. Huh. So, thoughts. We're not in Keiji's perspective. We're in, um, Momoru Akusaka's, Akasaka's perspective. A rookie policeman slash detective, I guess. This is different. I like different. Hmm. 
and we're also in the time period during the Hinamizawa Dam protests. Or the construction protests. Hmm. So we're finally getting some more information about the past, what happened during that incident. Obviously, like the beginning said, I'm not probably not going to be able to come up with any conjectures. It's going to be possible, impossible. But I'm already starting to get certain things. Like I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we're in this past event. Like I am glad about that. I'm, I mean, the whole, the first three stories always talked about the events just vaguely, but it never went into detail. And I'm kind of glad that we're kind of in this part where we can actually see what happened. I mean, unless the next chapter kind of pulls a heel turn and, hey, surprise, now we're cagey. <sighs> but, I don't know. Just so you guys know, I'm still going to try to get the, um, the, uh, patch. I'm still going to try to figure out how to get the patches, because, I don't know. I've been, I've been trying to get this done for a while and still not working, but I'm still, I'm not going to give up on that because I, I want to get the patches downloaded onto this. But, hey, we finally got started on Higurashi. Finally. And tomorrow we'll get started on Fate Stay Night. Ooh, I've been excited about that one. Again, I'm not even tired. Yeah, but I'm just, I'm, I mean, really the only thing I know how the patch I think worked was that it was the Japanese version, but... Obviously, the first thing that popped up was that I think it, what like the words were English, so I'm like, okay, yeah, this works. And without reading any of the uh, the first thing that popped up, I knew it was like a paragraph or something. I basically ignored that and I tried to mess with the menu a little bit. I like the menu layout. The menu looks really freaking cool, and it looks like it has that option where it has turn off the H, I guess the hentai scenes and um turn off or i it, there was another section that says censored or uncensored and i'm not entirely sure how that would work out so if you guys would be kind of to tell me like i got the the h scenes completely turned off but in terms of the censor should i censor it or should i not like i'm it does i'm not I'm, it doesn't really specify what's going to be censored like i don't know if you guys would be kind of to tell me that, I would greatly appreciate it. So that way we can get that all set up and there won't be anything, any confusion. But yeah, good lord, I'm glad to get back into Higurashi. I'm, I'm glad. It's definitely, it's kind of, I've been, I, I admit, I've been missing the mental torture. <laughs> oh well. Thank you guys so much for watching, and hopefully I will get this all sorted out. Hopefully I will have the patch, uh, hopefully I'll get the patches downloaded successfully so I can actually freaking install them. But, thank you guys so much for watching, and I will see you all in the next video.